And so I'm going to take up with, I think, like verse 19. 19. And I know that we're not going to, you know, be able to go in, into all the depth that we want to with some of these verses in between. This is, this is quite a, a, a beefy, if I can put it that way, chapter of, of the Gospel of John, where Jesus makes a lot of declarations that some are difficult to understand at, you know, at, at first reading. Uh, which is why, you know, this gospel was called for, um, it, it's always kind of been known as the sort of mystic gospel. It's a different uh, perspective of Jesus, a more mystic, a more a spiritual perspective on Jesus than the synoptic gospels. Um, but it merits, you know, what I want to do today is kind of take a, um, a zoom out, you know, get a sort of panoramic view of what's going on in the gospel of John. And, and, then, and then zoom in on one particular verse uh, that's very um, well known to us. Jesus said, if the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And, and over the next couple of weeks, to, to not, not only this Sunday, but the next couple of weeks, next Sunday, to go into what the meaning of that freedom is. You know, this is really something vital in this gospel. Jesus speaks about it in this chapter um, Repeatedly, what does he mean by that? Why can the Son set us free? And can't anyone else set us free? Can the Father set us free? Can the can the Spirit set us free? And 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 as we ask those questions, I want to also touch on the on the another aspect that is so clear in John, and and it, it's it's important that we we grasp it, which is the aspect of the Trinity that the Jesus is uh, presenting in this gospel. Let's read this together. Jesus made these statements while he was teaching in the section of the temple known as the treasury. But he was not arrested because his time had not yet come. Later, Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will search for me, but will die in your sin. You, you cannot come where I am going. So he's, he's telling the audience there, they're, they're in the temple grounds. He's telling them, I'm here now. Embrace who I am. Believe in me, because you won't always have me here. And, and he's saying, you can't follow me where I'm going. He's course speaking of going to the father's presence and he's saying in the condition of unbelief that you're in you won't be able to go there and so he's making this case for asking the the those who are gathered in 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 the audience there and the and there were a lot of people there because this is in the middle of one of the feasts and he's saying to them believe in me accept the fact that i am the son and and by the way if if you have not turned to Jesus and believed in Him and given your life wholly to Him. I hope that you do today. I hope that you make that decision today. I hope that you don't say, well, there's another time and, you know, there's a, there'll be another opportunity because we don't know what a day might bring. We don't know what, um, what, what uh, tomorrow will bring. We don't know how much more of life we have. So we don't take this for granted. I, I, I just in, invite you to embrace Jesus in all of His fullness today, today, in this moment. So He says, you can't go where I'm going. And the people ask, is He planning to commit suicide? What does He mean, you, you can't come where I am going? And the Jews had a very strong notion of suicide. For them, suicide was sort of like the unpardonable sin. That if you, killed, if you committed suicide, you would be condemned. You would... You would go to hell. And so he's saying, well, you know, they're taking for granted that they're going to heaven. Jesus is saying to them, you're not, you're not there yet. You don't believe in me. And so they're wondering, well, where can you go that we can't go? And so their conclusion is, is he talking about committing suicide? And Jesus continues. He says, you're from below. I am from above. You belong to this world. I do not. And this is why I said that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am. And notice that 
Um, I'm using here the New Living Translation. Those two words are are vital. They're crucial. I am, which is in the Greek, uh, ego, aimi. And for the people who are hearing these words that used mostly a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, when Jesus says this, when he says, I am the I am, they know that he's referring to back to Exodus when when uh, Moses asked God, who should I say is sending me? And Yahweh tells him, tell them I am is sending me. So he is making himself out to be equal with God. And and this is something, you know, this is going to be sort of the, the overarching theme that I'm going to be talking about today is Jesus as the Son. But not just the Son in the sense that He is born or He is created, but as the eternally begotten Son. And this, this is important because Jesus is inviting us into a relationship that he has enjoyed with the Father from all of eternity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the, this unity and this mystery that we call the Trinity. This is the salvation that Jesus died for, is to bring us into this, this, this union with him. And so he says, unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. And so this is the really the, the, the crux of our faith. What saves us? What saves us is that we, with all of our heart, with our mouth, we confess that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God has raised Him from the dead. Paul said, you shall be saved. He, so he uses the word kurios. We confess that He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. He is above all things. This is the belief that saves us. And it's this declaration and nothing else. This plus nothing else. Because Christianity isn't about behavior modification. It isn't about earning a place. It's about believing in the Son. And through believing in the Son, we're joined to the, to the, the Trinity. This is why the author of Hebrews said, how will you be saved if you neglect such a great salvation. Let's go on with this text. And then they ask him, Who are you? They demanded. And Jesus replied, The one I have always claimed to be. I have much to say about you and, and much to condemn, but I won't. For I say only what I have heard from the one who sent me, and he is completely truthful. But they still didn't understand that he was talking about his father. And so Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that, here it is, I am He. And by the way, many of His critics who were present there that day, when they beheld Jesus on the cross, that was the, 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 really the moment of His greatest glory, is, is just the way that He was, the way that He embraced his death and, and, and the things that were going on around him uh, as he was giving his life, the words he was speaking, the reaction of the crowd, the Roman cent- the hardened Roman centurion who had crucified I don't know how many people um, it, over his, his lifetime, looking up and saying, surely this man was the Son of God. And so this is why it's so important for us to behold him, to see him. Jesus said, You'll know this when I'm lifted up. I do nothing on my own, but I say only what the Father taught me. And the one who sent me is with me, and he has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. And then many who heard him say these things believed in him. And Jesus said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. Notice this. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So, in part, what sets us free is the revelation of the truth. Jesus said, if you follow me, you'll be my disciples. And it's important that you continue in my teachings because as you, as you embrace the truth that I'll be speaking to you through the Holy Spirit, the the the, the knowledge of God will increase in your life. And so, really, what in part what sets us free 
is we're set free from, from ignorance, from ignorance of who God is. And, you know, this is something that as believers we're called to continue to grow in because we're, we're, not, we're not all there yet. There's so much more of God to know and to, to grow in. Let's go on. The truth will set you free. And then they said, well, we're descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you will be set free? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. How can the Son set us free? Why is it the Son that sets free? I want you to look at Galatians uh, chapter 5. I'm going to skip over these verses here. To Galatians 5, which is, I think, you know, a, such an important book for today. It's such an important book in, in light of so many things that are going on uh, within Christianity and just false ideas about what salvation is, and uh, there's so many, you know, and I'm, I'm, I've experienced this recently even as a pastor who are being told, you know, it's, it's not enough that, that you just believe in Jesus. It's, you know, you have to also, you know, do X, Y, and Z and, and, and observe these days and, and do these things. And, you know, this notion of, of work salvation wasn't just something that, that the church leaders were leading, uh, dealing with in the first century. It's a reality today. God sent him, Paul writes to the Galatians, to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. You know, I want you to notice here that at the at the at the core of the spirit of you know we 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 hear the phrase a lot an orphan spirit at the very heart of the orphan spirit is a lack of revelation of what the spirit has done um, the spirit of his son in our hearts motivates us and prompts us to to cry out. Abba, Father. Now, this is interesting because in, in these verses, all three persons, I want you to notice this because I'm going to touch on this idea of Trinity and why it's important. Why is it important that when the, you know, when the, uh, the Jehovah's Witness people knock on your door and, and present you, to you a, a false gospel, a false notion of who Jesus is? You know, they, they believe uh, a very ancient heresy which is that, you know, Jesus is a God, but He is not God. He is not the God. He's a very exalted person, but He's not Yahweh. Where the Bible so clearly, especially in the Gospel of John, I, I don't know what they do with the Gospel of John. I've had several debates with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses who have come to the door, and they're not easy to debate because they've got all sorts of arguments that they get taught, right? But over and over and over and over again in John, Jesus, He says He makes, in fact, seven I Am statements. And when he says, he makes those I am statements, he's making himself to be equal with, with Yahweh, with the, the, the name of, of God in the Old Testament that, that couldn't even be uttered. It, it, it has, contains no, no vowels. Nobody knows exactly really how to, how to pronounce that. But this is why he came. He came to give us a spirit of sonship, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. And now, he says, you're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So, I want you to notice that Father, Son, and Spirit, all three involved in our salvation. Three in one. Not three gods. Not three different persons. Not, uh, I'm sorry, not, not three distinct and separate persons, but Three persons in one. Not one God expressing Himself in three ways. That's another thing that you'll hear, that uh, there's one God. Sometimes He appears as Jesus. Sometimes He appears as the Spirit. Sometimes He appears as the Father. It's, it's, it's not that at all. 
a triune God who is and has always existed in this triunity. Now, bear with me. You're saying, why, why, it, 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 you know, why is this important? I want to say, first of all, that I believe that one of the biggest deficiencies in the church today is a famine of the Word of God. Um, there is so much biblical illiteracy that it's astounding. Uh, I, I think m- many, many folks read other books way more than they read their Bible. Uh, you know, we, we need to measure everything that we're reading against what the Scripture is saying. And, and by the way, the Bible is understandable. And as you go to the Scriptures, the, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you what He wants you to know about Jesus. If your heart is open to knowing Jesus. Jesus was concerned with, with doctrine. He was concerned with right teaching. Right teaching is important. It's, this is not about mincing theological hairs here, or splitting theological hairs, rather. This is, this is about truth that sets us free. Because it, it's the, the truth that liberates us from the ignorance about God. This is why this is important. In fact, in the very last book of the Bible, Jesus speaks to several churches and he says, you know, I have this one thing against you. You guys are doing really well, but I have this one thing against you. And several times he says, you hold to this false teaching. And then he calls out that false teaching. In, in one case, it was a, a group of folks called the Nicolaitans who were uh, telling people that they could abuse the grace of God, that they could participate in, in, in the sexual orgies that were part of the religions of the day, and that it wouldn't matter. And this teaching became very popular because if you were, if you wanted to get a job, a lot of times you had to uh, participate in what the unions of the day, the guilds, were doing. And many times they were participating in these temple feasts, and and you had to embrace that. You had to be part of that that Greek culture. And if you didn't embrace it, then they would kick you out of the guild, and you couldn't do your carpentry, you couldn't do your stonework, you couldn't do whatever you were doing, and so. The temptation was to give in and to compromise the gospel. And Jesus said, in fact, he, he uses very strong language. He says, I hate this teaching. And so, what specifically is the correct doctrine about the Trinity? And why is this so important? So many um, men and women of God over the, the centuries have given their life in fact, and especially in the very early first centuries, to declare the, the correct truth about who Jesus is, who the Father is, and who the Spirit is, and why it's important to understand this. Um, how many of you are familiar with Rich Mullins, the singer Rich Mullins? You ever heard of Rich Mullins? Rich died um, probably a couple decades ago now, but he, some, some of the songs that, I don't know how many of the songs are still being sung in the churches today, um, what are some of his famous songs that our God is an awesome God? Um, sing your praise to the Lord. These were uh, major, major uh, songs within the church that were sung for for many years. But I think Rich died back in the in the 90s, and so this this latest generation never. He was a great songwriter, tremendous songwriter. In fact, there's a a movie about his life that's out there now that uh, is on on television. He wrote a song called Creed. And what he did was he put the Apostles' Creed into song. And I think it it hits the nail in the head. And he sings these words. He says, I believe what I believe is what makes me what I am. I did not make it. No, it's making me. It's the very truth of God and not the invention of any man. And he goes on. His song is longer than that. And it, it expresses and declares the Apostles' Creed. Um, another one of these uh, famous theologians from long ago uh, named um, Augustine. You see where I have this quotation. He said this about the Trinity. And he, it, Augustine is one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church. He was he lived in, uh, in the air in the the area which is now called Libya. He was an African. Uh, he was a tremendous teacher. It's called uh, Augustine of Hippo. I don't know if that city exists anymore. 
many, many, many of the churches, you know that the northern coast of Africa in the first um, four centuries had become in, entirely Christian. There were churches everywhere. There were great centers of learning. The gospel had spread tremendously. And when the, 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 the Muslim uh, uh, religion began to spread, they destroyed these churches. They, they burnt libraries, a, a tremendous library. Uh, in the city of Alexandria in Egypt was completely... God knows what documents and things were lost uh, forever uh, because of what happened there. So, you know, when you hear people say, well, you know, these are Muslim lands, you know, that, that's their... Well, way before the, the spread of Islam, the, the church had, had basically uh, spread and, and was growing and, and was vital all over the north of Africa. Augustine said this about, about the Trinity. He said, In no other subject is error more dangerous or inquiry more laborious or the discovery of truth more profitable. Another uh, modern theologian said this. He said, The ra- rather obvious thought that when his disciples were about to have the world collapse on them, our Lord spent so much time in the upper room, speaking to them about the mystery of the Trinity. If anything could underline the necessity of Trinitarianism for practical... Listen, so Trinitarianism is not just some theological thing, but it's important for for practice, for daily living. That must surely be it. Now, remember I told you we're going to zoom out of the Gospel and, and zoom back in? If you look at, you know, in the upper room is where Jesus... Uh, where seven chapters of the Gospel of John take place. John, uh, John 14, John 15, John 16, John 17, uh, maybe 6, and, and I think uh, portions of John 13, are all teachings that are going on in the very last days, in, in the week of His Passion. Because, you know, by John 18 and 19, now He's before Pilate. He is preparing to go to the cross. So what does he do in John 14 and 16? He speaks about who? He speaks about the Spirit. Uh, what does he do in John 17? He speaks about his relationship and, the, and his union with the Father. Now bear that thought for a second. Hold it. So 20% of the book of John, of this Gospel, at the most crucial moment, at the most vital moment for the disciples, his last opportunity to sit with them and to teach them, the fundamental thing that Jesus does is reveal truth about the Trinity. This is what he means by the truth shall set you free. He told Philip in John 14, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father, look at this, except through me, through him, literally, through his, his flesh. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip says, Lord, show us the father. What is he like? Reveal him to us. You know, if you're going to leave, as you're saying, we want to take us to the father. Show us the father. And Jesus replies, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet, you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show Him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? And the words that I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does His work through me. John, can you bring up, bring up Matthew 11? I, I have these out of order um, Relative to my notes, Matthew eleven twenty seven, Jesus says something again crucial and very similar. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son. And those, listen, whom the Son chooses to reveal to Him. When He makes these statements in the upper room to the disciples, Philip says, Philip says, show us the Father. 
and and Jesus says, I've been with you all this time, and and you don't know this. I haven't you seen that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. And repeatedly through the Gospel of John, he's been speaking on this. And then he tells him in John 14, a little bit later, he says, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. When I say I'm leaving, I'm not leaving you as orphans. I am sending another advocate, he calls him, another counselor. And he uses the words in the Greek, the words alos, which means one exactly, one who is doing the same thing, the advocate, one who is walking alongside you, parallel to you, next to you. And then he tells him, and he is with you now, but he will be where? He will be in you. He will be in you. And so, you know, again, I mentioned earlier, the root of the orphan spirit is the ignorance of the Holy Spirit. At the root, let me repeat that again. This is why the truth sets us free. At the root of, of this orphan spirit, which I think is, is, is one of the most, I think, dangerous things that we embrace from the enemy, the lie that, that, you know, that Jesus is not with me, that he, he doesn't care, that uh, I'm not good enough, that, uh, you know, I'll never be, you know, what God, you know, this, this sort of, I, I can't describe it any other way, but an orphan spirit. Woe is me, little old me, you know, who am I? At the root of that is the ignorance of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. These words of Jesus show us that the revelation, listen, that brings true freedom comes through Jesus. We have to go through Jesus. And so the work of Jesus in conjunction today with the Holy Spirit is to reveal the fullness of God, the fullness of the Godhead to us. And this happens through Him, through His body. Remember what happened when Jesus dies on the cross and He gives up the Spirit? What immediately happened? The veil in the temple that separated the, the holy place from the ho- most holy place was rent, was torn. This was a curtain four inches thick. Now what is the significance of that? Well, if you, if you look at the picture, the, the tabernacle and the temple, it's all about Jesus. It's a picture of Jesus. It reveals Jesus. And that veil was symbolic of Him, of His flesh. And so when He gives up His life, the, the immediate first thing that happens is the veil is rent. It's torn wide open. And now the holy place, the most holy place, is available. And not just for the high priest, not just one day a year on Yom Kippur, which is, I think is just about right now the Jewish people are celebrating that. We have access to that place. But it's not enough to know that. We're called to enter into it. You know, that's one of the most important themes of the, of the book of Hebrews. It, it was about the Christians who were discouraged. They were being persecuted. They were being harassed by the enemy. Hello? You appreciate that? That's what he does full time. He harasses you. He accuses you. He tries to get you to embrace the, what you were, the orphan. You're no longer an orphan. You've been embraced. You've been bought. You've been, you've been made a son. Listen. It doesn't say that you will become a son. It says you have been made a son through Jesus. It's not just about the theology of the Trinity. It's about understanding where we are in relation to that the triune God and what that means to us. In Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says, Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets, through the, the, the books that we have as part of what we call the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. Now in these final days, listen, He has spoken to us through His Son. God promised everything to the Son as an inheritance. And through the Son, He created the universe. The Son, I love this, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the power of His hand. By His command, rather. 
What's, what's the author saying? That God has always been speaking to man. But today, He speaks not through representatives, not through others who are inspired, not just through voices. You know, we can still hear the voice of God speaking to us or through angels. But He speaks directly through His Son who expresses His very character, His own glory. God has always been speaking. This is about revelation, by the way. His revelation has come in different ways, through dreams and visions, through His direct voice, through men chosen by Him. He's always been speaking, but you know what? The world and, and those people that Jesus was speaking to in chapter they've been tuned to the wrong channel. They're listening to the wrong channel. He is speaking through the air, through His Son. So here's the thing. This is why it's important that we know and believe and embrace Jesus as the I Am, as Yahweh, as God. We don't know God, and we cannot know God unless it's through the Son. Jesus doesn't just tell us about God. He reveals God by uniting us to Himself. You get that? It's not just learning what He says about God. There's, there's some revelation in that. But the, the, the depths of, of who He is and what He is to us and the transformation in our lives comes because He joins us. We're joined to Him. And then we're joined to the family, to the triunity of God. We're joined to Christ. Over and over again, I think it's like 72 times in, in Paul's letters, in the different epistles, he uses the phrase, in Christ. It's one of his favorite verses. I think he uses it 72 times in his letters. 36 times in the book of Ephesians. That's why it's important to read the Bible. To, to understand the Bible, to be in the Word of God. We're joined to Him. We're in Christ now. And he, he, by the way, he writes this and he tells people some of the most, let's say, immature Christians. Because it's not maturity in Christ that makes you in Christ. It's the fact that you're in Christ that will bring you to maturity as the Spirit of God reveals Christ more and more and more in the Father. So here's, here's the thing. Regardless of what you did this morning or what mood you came in with or where your emotional composure is this morning, you have been joined. If you have believed in Him, if you had said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I believe that He is the I Am, you have been joined to Him. You're in Christ. You're in constant communion with Him, whether we're consciously aware of it or not. You know, it's our... It, it's, 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 it's our ignorance of that, our willful ignorance of that, that grieves the Spirit, but the Spirit doesn't leave. He's still in you. He's sad, but He's still in you. He's still in communion with you. You know, this is why over and over and over again, Paul says, now that you know this, put on Christ. Put Him on. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit. And he, he tells believers, you know, it, it, you know he, sometimes he gives all these warnings, and then he says, but... But you're better than this. This is who you are. He's calling them to, to be who God, to walk in, in what God has made them to be. So, He doesn't say these things so that we can earn it. We don't, when, it's not about earning sonship. He's calling us to live in, in this sonship. And I'm going to finish with, with, I want to show you this picture of um, a guy named Athanasius. Athanasius was an Egyptian, a black theologian, one of the greatest theologians. I bet that, you know, I, I bet in, in, in when, when, when they celebrate in the public schools, you know, the, uh, uh, they, they teach um, African-American kids all about the great African-Americans. And they should teach about Athanasius. <laughs> they should go back. And, uh, and, and Augustine, also, who was an African. Athanasius was a brilliant, brilliant theologian. 
And he was present. You know, many of you know the Nicene Creed and you've uttered the Nicene Creed over the years. Um, he was there when the Nicene Creed was formed. And he was one of the great advocates. Go to the other photo, uh, the other picture rather. It was Athanasius, and you can you know look this up. You can you can Google Athanasius, A T H A N I S U S. I think he stood up against uh, 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 another theologian who was called Arius, and Arius was teaching and spreading the teaching that Jesus was not in the same essence as God, that uh, he was great, but he was not God. He was something lesser than God, which is essentially what the Jehovah's Witness teach, and in part what the the Mormon faith also teaches. So when they say, I believe in Jesus, you have to ask the question, what Jesus do you believe in? Because that does matter. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, ego, amy, these are his words, you will die in your sins. So why is that important? It's important for this reason. And this diagram kind of shows it. This is the, 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 a picture of the Trinity. Nothing that we do or say can actually reveal it or explain it perfectly. It's a mystery. But the Father is joined to the Son and joined to the Spirit. But the Spirit is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Spirit. But each three is God. Each three, they're working together for all of eternity, before God even created us, before He even um, spoke the universe into being, they were, and they were happy, and, and they, were, they were blessed together. They, they, this unity that they lived in, there was, it was a full relationship. It was a perfect relationship. It is the perfect relationship. This is why Christianity and the faith that we, we believe in is so relational, because what Jesus, what happened when we believe in Him, when we express faith in Him, is that we're joined to that, that bliss that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have always enjoyed. And so that's why it's important that you believe in the Trinity. Uh, Athanasius gave his, his life to this. In fact, Constantine, the Roman emperor, said to him, because he... He, ex, he excommunicated Arius from the church. He said, this, this is dangerous what this guy's teaching, and I will not accept it. The Roman emperor said, you will accept it, or you're going to suffer the consequences. And he said, so be it. And he was banished up north to the, um, somewhere up in Germany. He was taken out of Africa. Imagine you know, for somebody living in Egypt being sent up there. But he did it, and he suffered, and he suffered persecution. People have given their lives so that we get this truth. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So what do we take out of this? What do we take out of this? People, enjoy God. Enjoy God. Coming into His presence is not a heavy thing. It's something that restores us, that connects us with Him, that it fills us with, with the knowledge of God, and it's what sets us free. It's what gives us, you know, being part of the, the, the Trinity and being consciously aware of who we are is what gives us power also to live in this world. It gives us, because we're sons. And if the Son has set you free, you know, the Son is not a pretender to the throne. He is the legitimate one. And so you have been brought into sonship by somebody who has the right to rule and the right to make you an heir and to make you a son. Let's stand together.